Hi, it's Lauren here, producer of The Brendan O'Neill Show. Before we get into this week's brilliant episode with Martin Kuldorf, I just wanted to let you all know that Spike's internship programme is now open for applications. We're looking for an aspiring journalist to join our team on a six-month paid full-time placement. You'd be working with us at the Spiked office in London, helping us do everything from putting out our articles to producing podcasts like this one. And you don't need any prior experience to apply. What we're looking for is someone who has a spark for journalism, writing or podcasting, and who has a passion for our pro-freedom, pro-human message. Everything else you can learn on the job. I started at Spiked as an intern, so I can highly recommend applying for this. It's an amazing experience and you get to earn while doing something you love. There really is nowhere better to kickstart your career in journalism. To find out more and to reply, go to spiked-online.com slash interns. That's spiked-online.com slash interns. You have until Sunday the 19th of May to apply. Good luck. I think we're sort of on a big fight now whether the authoritarians are going to win or or not. Claiming to combat misinformation, social media companies censored true public health information from myself and many other people during the pandemic. And of course, their argument was that, okay, life is more important than freedoms. But I would say it was never a contradiction between those two. And I think that's what's proved here during the lockdown. In a crisis, that's when we really, really have to have more speech. Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Martin Kuldorf. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brendan. It's a great pleasure. It's brilliant to have you on um, at last. I've wanted you on for a long time. And of course, what I want to talk to you about today is COVID, lockdowns, uh, your dissenting opinion on these matters and the consequences you suffered as a result of your dissenting opinions. I really want to dig down into all of that stuff with you today. Uh, But I guess I want to kick off with a broad question, which is that we've just passed the fourth anniversary of Boris Johnson making that very solemn statement to the whole British nation in which he essentially instructed us to stay at home. You must stay at home, is, is what he said. And that really opened up a whole new unprecedented moment in British life, and of course it happened across the world as well, where we were essentially put under house arrest uh, to protect ourselves from this new virus. So it's been four years. I can't tell if it feels like it should be longer than that or shorter than that, but it's been four years. And I want to start off by asking you whether you think the discussion has changed much in that time. Do you think people now, four years later, are coming to their senses a little bit on lockdown? Do you think there's more openness to the idea that it might not have been the right approach? What's your take on where the conversation about lockdown currently stands? Well, I think by now, if you look at the public, most people realise what a big mistake it was. They suffered through the collateral damage. They realised that uh, these lockdowns didn't do any good. And uh, so slowly people have sort of been realizing that they were tricked and fooled. And uh, what, uh, what was claimed that there was scientific consensus for lockdowns was actually not the case because they also know now that more and more people had actually spoken up, even though they didn't hear about it uh, three or four years ago. So let's talk a little bit about um, your take on all of this and some of the arguments that you made. So Many people will be familiar with you as one of the signatories to the Great Barrington Declaration alongside Sinitra Gupta and Jay Bhattacharya and subsequently many other people too, where fairly early on, I think, in the lockdown year, in the lockdown moment, you guys put forward an alternative view, which is that perhaps we shouldn't lock down every single citizen, but instead take a more focused approach. Let people go about their lives unless they are at great risk from covid unless they're elderly or disabled or have some form of underlying condition. People will remember that you guys did that. People will also remember the extraordinary fallout from your intervention into the discussion and and the consequences that all of you have experienced. But just remind us um, what the core nature of the case that you were making and why you thought it was important in that year, in that moment, to say, look, there might be a different way of doing this. So already in the beginning of 2020, uh, as soon as the pandemic hit northern Italy and Iran, which was the first places outside of China where there were major outbreaks, it was obvious to any thinking infectious disease technologist that this was spread to the whole world and there was nothing we could do about it. 
and lockdowns would just be futile in terms of stopping the spread of, of this disease. The other thing that was also obvious from the very beginning, yes, from the Wuhan data, before there was a single death in the US, is that, well, at that time, we didn't know what the infection fatality rate was. We didn't know what the relative risk was. So I did some calculations uh, based on the Wuhan mortality data, uh, where we had the ages of those who died. And it was clear that there was more than a thousandfold difference in the risk of dying from COVID from the older to the younger. So this was a dangerous disease for older people. If you were in the 70s, 80s, or even 90s, it was not a danger for children or for young adults. So then the obvious thing to do if you're a public health scientist is you do everything you can to protect the older people. We utterly failed to protect them. It was impossible to prevent them all from dying, but we could have done a lot better. We could have reduced mortality among the elderly if we have been serious about protecting them. Instead, we closed schools, uh, we closed uh, businesses, we closed restaurants, we closed social events, cultural events, uh, religious services, and so on, which did not help, uh, but which had enormous collateral damage on public health. So uh, people didn't get the cancer screenings or the cancer treatment they needed. So now somebody will die from, let's say, cervical cancer three or four years from now instead of living another 20 years. Uh, people stayed home, uh, they didn't go to the hospital, so they died from cardiovascular disease at home instead of getting the proper treatment. Uh, diabetes, uh, the childhood vaccination rates plummeted. And, uh, of course, the mental health was catastrophic. This was the biggest uh, public health fiasco ever, the biggest public health disaster in, in centuries and uh, completely unavoidable because it was self-inflicted by these lockdowns. Yeah, what you described there, you know, the worst of both worlds where we locked everyone down, including the young and the people who would not suffer greatly from a COVID infection, while at the same time actually failing to protect older generations. And, and Britain is a very good example of that, where everyone's freedom was taken away, school kids weren't going to school, and yet COVID-19 still ravaged care homes and killed thousands and thousands of elderly people. They weren't sufficiently protected. So you really had a situation where it was the worst of both worlds, a loss of freedom and a failure to protect those who were most vulnerable to the virus. So in relation to that, I wanted to ask you why you think there was so much hostility to what you guys were saying, especially with the Great Barrington Declaration. But do you think it was just that by that stage, the consensus had been so solidified, so firmed up in public life and political life, that any form of dissent would have been seen as heresy, essentially? Do you think we had reached a stage of conformism by the time the Great Barrington Declaration came out, which just meant that it was inevitable that you lot were going to get flack for saying something that, as you say, now most people treat as being fairly commonsensical. I think the hostility was already there in March of 2020. It was just that there was different. So in March and uh, during that spring, there was enormous uh, hostility and attacks on Sweden. Sweden was paneled in the international media, uh, saying that Sweden was killing its citizens and so on. Spike was one of the few media outlets that was questioning lockdowns already in March and April, and uh, you were attacked. But in the beginning, there was sort of silencing those of us scientists who spoke up. So I tried to publish in the U.S., but I couldn't, even though I was a professor of medicine at Harvard. I had no problems publishing in the major daily newspapers in, uh, uh, in Sweden, but that's in Swedish, so that won't be read by many. You were very gracious and published an op-ed in Spike in April of 2020, where I basically said the same thing as in the Great Britain Declaration. Uh, but you're not as widely read as The Telegraph or The Guardian or uh, New York Times and so on. So uh, there was a silencing. And every time somebody spoke up, whether it was me or Scott Atlas or Jay Balasharya, there was an, mostly a silencing and sometimes attack on Scott Atlas or Jay Balasharya. Uh, so what happened in October, we didn't present anything that the three of us hadn't said before. So what, when we wrote the Great Parental Declaration, there was nothing new in it. The thing that was new was that they had dismissed us by saying, oh, that's just one person. That's just Jay Barashayo. That's just Scott Atlas. Or yes, that's Neta Gupta. Or this person is not qualified because they don't do in the right area. Or 
this is just nobody. They're not really a proper scientist in a prestigious place. So what happened with the great parental aggression is there were three of us. We had all worked a long time in infectious disease technology, so they couldn't dismiss us because we were in the wrong field. And we were all from prestigious uh, universities, uh, Stanford, Harvard, and Oxford. So they couldn't dismiss that. They tried like for a day or two to sort of ignore it, but that didn't work. So instead, they did the slandering and the attacks. The reason they did it is because they didn't have any argument. They didn't have any public health arguments, the scientific arguments. What they were doing went against the basic principles of public health. If you want to argue something and you don't have the arguments, you can either do silencing, censoring, or you can do slandering and attacking. And they did first one, and then in October 2020, when the Great Barrington Declaration, they couldn't do that completely, so then they went on the attack. And director of NIH called us uh, fringe epidemiologists and asked for a devastating takedown. Christian Drosten in Germany, uh, who was sort of the lead architect of lockdowns in Germany, he called up pseudoscientists. Matt uh, Hancock sort of uh, dismissed us in the parliament in the UK. And of course, Jeremy Farrar was uh, also pushing against this. And of course, if they think they are right, they should push against it and argue against it. But the way to do it is not to do a devastating takedown. For example, Francis Collins, he's the head of NIH. What he should have done is to say, okay, we have different views here. Let's organize the discussion. Let's have a panel here. And we go through the various disagreements. That's what he should have done. But instead, I did... uh, slandering and silencing because they didn't have the arguments on their side. Yeah, I I always think that when there is that kind of reaction where it's not so much, I think you're wrong and I'm going to debate it with you and prove that you're wrong, but instead it's you're evil, you're a granny killer, you're dangerous, you're a pseudoscientist. It's that kind of slanderous approach. I always think that that's a bit of a giveaway that that person doesn't have solid arguments or certainly doesn't have confidence in their own arguments and doesn't trust in the scientific process, in fact, which ought to be a process of discussion and falsifiability and pitting one argument against another, one form of evidence against another. It was really indicative that they'd lost faith in science and free, open discussion, that they would respond in such a rash way to you three in particular. In relation to that, I wanted to ask you what that experience felt like. I remember following it in the media at the time. And I saw all those attacks that you've just mentioned. And um, Sunitra Gupta in particular here in the UK seemed to really get it in the neck. You know, there was a period of time when every time you opened the Guardian newspaper, there'd be an attack on her. Um, But of course, you and Jay Bhattacharya got it really badly too. Um, Were you taken aback, even given the authoritarianism that had preceded the Great Barrington Declaration in relation to the lockdown and and the difficulty of getting those ideas out there? Even given all of that, it was a pretty shocking response, wasn't it, to what you published? Uh, I was shocked. And I never imagined that I, as a simple scientist, stating uh, what used to be basic fundamental principles of public health would get this attack, sort of be suddenly in the center of the political whirlwind of the world. So that was a shock. The interesting thing for me, though, was that I actually had two completely different experiences simultaneously, because I was mostly active in the US and in the the world stage debate, but I was also part of the Swedish debate. I published in the Swedish newspapers uh, to defend the Swedish strategy, so in the US and UK, I was sort of the fringe trying to oppose the establishment. But in the Sweden, I was actually defending what Anders Tegnell and Johan Gieseke was doing with uh, not closing everything down, but trying to protect older people. So there I was sort of the establishment view. There was a group of, uh, they, they were called the group of 22 uh, scientists. There were there was only one infectious disease biologist, but there was other scientists like a mathematician and ecologist and a, a climate scientist uh, and so on. And they opposed the Swedish strategy and wanted Sweden to do the same thing as the rest of the world. So they published in the major newspapers in Sweden and their views, which I completely disagree with. And I responded to those, including Anders Tegnell, but also many other epidemiologists in Sweden. And even though I disagree 100% with what they said, I'm very glad that they wrote it. That was a very good thing, because 
there was obviously not just the 22, there was obviously thousands of other people in Sweden who also had this question. Well, why are we doing it differently? Uh, why aren't we doing the same as Boris Johnson in the UK and so on? So that discussion, that open discussion was extremely important to have. So I'm very thankful for them that actually did write that. And that allowed then the rest of us to respond in a nice and polite uh, manner to uh, to counter it. And that led, I think, to more trust in the Swedish approach among the public, because the public in Sweden always supported it. There was never any major opposition in Sweden to it, despite everybody being able to read English and uh, sort of the international press here. Here at Spiked, we know that many of you probably have a great business idea, but actually turning that idea into the real deal can be full of challenges. Luckily, there's a way to make your first step easy, and it sounds like this. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the game-changing all-in-one commerce platform that empowers you to become your own boss. Shopify enables up-and-coming entrepreneurs like you across the world, whether you trade in electric guitars or vintage model cars, by simplifying how you sell your products both in-store and online. Your big idea can now become your full-time job. Shopify helps you grow your business by bringing everything under one digital umbrella. Through Shopify's simple dashboard and shop-ready point-of-sale system, managing orders and payments becomes effortless. So you have more time to focus on the bigger picture. Plus, Shopify will help you put your brand on those all-too-crucial social media platforms. From Facebook to TikTok, you'll easily be able to reach your potential customers wherever they may be. And don't worry about losing control of your business. Shopify gives you all the tools and business courses you need to stay one step ahead of the competition. And through Shopify's simple customization tools, keeping your unique image will never be a problem. So why wait? If you want to bring your business idea to life, get started with Shopify today. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash Brendan, all lowercase. That's shopify.co.uk slash Brendan to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.co.uk slash Brendan. Yeah, um, listening to you say that, I think to myself, you know, I'm one of those old fashioned people who actually welcomes the expression of views that I don't agree with because it contributes to discussion and it allows you as an individual to sharpen your own views to to give your response to develop your own argument so you know i take that view that debate is a good thing opposing views are a good thing but of course that wasn't the case when you guys brought out the great barrington declaration there was the opposite response which is that debate is dangerous these ideas are dangerous we, we need to shut them down um you've mentioned sweden of course sweden is your home country that's where uh, as you say you wrote a lot of stuff in defense of the swedish approach to COVID-19. And I want to ask you about how Sweden fared, because you will recall that the discussion about Sweden over the past few years became at times just completely hysterical. Uh, It was viewed as a pariah state, a demonic state, you know, experimenting on the population. Everyone was going to die. It was really interesting to watch that uh, demonization of Sweden here in the UK, because amongst the liberal left in Britain, Sweden has traditionally been seen as a social democratic paradise, one of the nicest nations in the world. Uh, You know, every lefty liberal in London basically wants to move to Sweden, but overnight it became this kind of rogue state doing something incredibly dangerous. But it wasn't the case, was it, that Sweden um, fared worse than other countries? And in fact, in some ways, it fared better, even though it didn't enforce a strict lockdown and instead left a lot of the decision-making to ordinary citizens. So could you say a bit about what Sweden did and how it fared in the long run? Well, historically, I mean, I, I love my country, Sweden. I never considered it a paradise before. But actually, during the during the pandemic, I actually was very jealous. And I did think of it as, I guess, a social democratic paradise because the prime minister at the time was a social democrat. In the U.S., uh, I was supporting the uh, DeSantis, for example. He he skipped lockdowns and open schools, so he's a Republican. So in, in the US, I, I guess I was a, a right-wing extremist, and in Sweden, I was a left-wing fanatic. But to me, public health is not political, so it, you have to sort of just say what public health is and sort of put the politics aside. And I was willing to have discussions and interviews with media from the left to the right, because that's what public health has to do. 
But if you go back to uh, uh, the result, I'm happy to tell you that people in Sweden are still alive, uh, which you wouldn't have thought or if you read the international media three or four years ago. But not only that, the ultimate uh, outcome is mortality, because that includes both COVID mortality as well as mortality from the collateral damage from the lockdowns. So we can compare excess mortality in Sweden versus other countries. And excess mortality mean, means that you take the mortality that you've seen in the three or five years before the pandemic, and you calculate, okay, if we have the same mortality, how much would we have during the pandemic from 2020 to 23 or 2020 to 22? And then we see, okay, that's the, one, the number of people we would have expected to die. And then how many people actually did die from all causes? And that's the excess mortality. And Sweden had an excess mortality uh, during the pandemic of about 4 or 5%. And to compare that with the rest of the world, yeah, that is the lowest among all major Western countries. There's no other major country in Europe or US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand that had a lower excess mortality. Denmark and Norway also had very low mortality, and they didn't do harsh lockdowns as uh, Germany and uh, and UK, many other countries still in Europe, or, uh, or many parts of the US. Uh, but Sweden is the lowest. So it's obviously that uh, Sweden did not kill its citizens. And in fact, it has among the lowest COVID mortality. Uh, but the excess mortality is the lowest because the COVID mortality wasn't high. And then it minimized the collateral damage, the mortality from other diseases. That's just mortality. If you also look, for example, at uh, schools, it's important for kids to go to school because they have to learn things. And in the U.S., we can study the test results because they make test results uh, every year, and it plummeted uh, after the pandemic. And that's not a surprise because there's a reason why we put kids in school, and that is to learn things. Uh, In Sweden, there was no such decline in the test scores. And, of course, that doesn't show up in the mortality statistics for this year, but it does show up in the long term, both uh, financial and health, physical health, for decades to come. So this was a disaster, these lockdowns, and it's something that we have to live with now for decades. Yeah, I think the um, the Sweden experiment, as people were referring to it, even though, in truth, the experiment was being carried out by every other country who were doing things that had never been done before, Uh, experimenting on entire populations. But I think what's so interesting about the Swedish experience is that it's such a useful alternative thinking point about the entire history of COVID and lockdowns. It does provide an example with facts and statistics that should at least give people pause for thought in relation to whether lockdown was the right thing to do. Unlike you, I'm not a medical expert. I've never been a professor of medicine. I'm not an epidemiologist. But it seems to me that one of the clearest arguments I've seen is that the countries that had the toughest lockdown measures or more lockdown measures than other countries did not experience lower excess death rates during the COVID period. And that seems to me to be the killer argument. You can really clearly see that the countries that really enforced these tough measures, one after another, two lockdowns, three lockdowns, whatever it was, They didn't have lower excess death rates than other nations, including Sweden. So doesn't that settle the argument in some ways? It seems pretty clear that severe lockdown does not equal saving people's lives from this virus. I think you're correct. And I never doubted that that would be the case, like even four years ago. But of course, now we have it on black and white. And it's actually not only comparing countries, because the U.S. is interesting in the sense that public health is not decided at the federal level. Essentially, public health is decided by the states. So if you also compare the different states in the U.S., you don't see that California, which locked down very harsh, did not have great outcomes. It had slightly worse outcomes than Florida, which was one of the states that did the least. Uh, North and South Dakota, they are next to each other. South Dakota didn't lock down. They are almost identical in terms of their COVID rates, both when you look at between countries as well as when you look at between states in the U.S. Since the states had different policies, you don't see any benefit of these lockdowns. And you see negative consequences from the collateral damage. So one question that has really um, niggled at me over the past few years is why there was 
such a great reluctance to talk about the potential social and health and economic impacts of lockdown. Because I've always thought that um, a part of the public health approach is that you not only think about what's good for the public's health, but you also think about the potential consequences, the potential side effects of any form of intervention into public health. So you, you weigh things up and you look at things in the round and of course, we all know that the approach of medicine ought to be first do no harm. Um, but it seems that there was a great reluctance to talk about the uh, collateral damage that might accrue as a result of the lockdowns. You know, there was one report, I think, or a couple of reports were done by the British government looking at the potential downsides of lockdown. But it was never really a central focus in public discussion. It was never really a central focus in political discussion. Why do you think that reluctance was there to look at the very basic possibility that stopping kids from going to school would have an impact on their mental health and their educational levels or discouraging people from going to hospitals which was explicitly done here in the UK you know basically we were told leave the NHS alone that that might have consequences on cancer diagnosis or people getting treatment for a stroke or a heart attack why was there a reluctance to have an open discussion about those potential side effects do you think that's a very good question, and I don't know if I have a good answer. Uh, certainly, the people who did write it, like in UK, uh, Dr. Sneda Gupta at Oxford, Dr. Carl Hennigan at Oxford, uh, Dr. Carol Sikora, and so on, they were hammered for writing these things, and it was obvious things. And I mean, the NIH director in the US, uh, Francis Collin, he has acknowledged that they ignored it and they shouldn't have. So there is some realization now. So why did this happen? I, I don't know, but but one thing that's relevant, I think, is that lockdown sort of protected the laptop class, which you and I belong to, who could sit home and we could have the pizza delivered. Uh, but it was brutal against the working class and the middle class. School closures was bad for all children, but it was especially bad for uh, working class and middle class children. In the U.S., many of the Rich families, they sent the kids to private schools or pot schools or tutoring and so on, including the governor of uh, California who sent his children to private school where he closed the public schools. So this was the biggest uh, assault on the working class in uh, more than a generation, I think. And maybe that's also why Sweden did it differently because Sweden's prime minister is actually from the working class. He's a welder. So maybe he could see that perspective more easily than most politicians, because like in the UK, you have the Labour Party, but I don't think any of the top people in the Labour Party is actually from the Labour class or the working class. So uh, there was certainly a disconnect about what the politicians or sort of their life and the lives of ordinary people. If you look at me and, and uh, Sunita Gupta and uh, uh, Dr. J. Barasharya, we all have experience, for example, from, from having lived and worked in the third world. So maybe we have sort of that perspective that other people maybe didn't have because also the lockdowns, they were terrible in, uh, in the U.S. And, and Europe, but uh, they were even worse in many parts of the, of the developing world where they sort of closed the markets. And then you have poor people who live day to day, they sell the food on the on the streets and then uh, they use the money to uh, buy ingredients for the next day and they get to eat some of, of, of their profits. And suddenly the rug was pulled out of them. Uh, they couldn't make a living. So now they had to sort of walk home long distances to their villages. This was a devastating thing in places like India or Africa or parts of uh, South America and so on. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's very well put. And it, it became clear quite early on, I think, that whereas the laptop classes or uh, the pyjama classes, as they're sometimes referred to, people who can sit at home and relax and, and carry on working, where they seem to almost welcome the lockdown as a kind of experiment to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and they could live fairly comfortably during lockdown and not suffer huge consequences. It was clear that it would have a a, a very detrimental impact on other sections of society. And it, it was decided a lot, I think, by class, which class was a person in was often a key determinant in terms of how destructive the lockdown would be on their economic fortunes, their kids' futures, and so on. But I did want to ask you specifically about what you think some of the fallout from lockdowns will be. So you said earlier on that we're going to be living with 
the consequences of this public health policy, this political decision for uh, for a long time to come. I think that's right. Um, what do you see as some of the worst outcomes from it? I mean, one thing that's always struck me is that we live in an era in which everything is seen as potentially detrimental to young people's mental health. You know, if they're on their phones for too long, if someone bullies them in the school playground, or if they hear a a word or an idea that they disapprove of, you know, they will collapse, their self-esteem will collapse. We live in a very snowflakey era in which the young are seen as being incredibly vulnerable. And I think that's often very exaggerated. But the same people who make that argument seemed very relaxed about forcing young people to stay indoors for six months without seeing their friends, without going to school, without engaging with teachers, and paid very little heed at all to the possibility that that might have a real impact on their mental faculties, their sense of self. So there was that real hypocritical uh, approach as well. But in relation to kids' mental health, their education, and other issues too, what do you see as being some of the, the worst downsides of this policy we pursued? Well, if I can go back in time and only change one thing, the thing I would change was to make sure the schools were open. Because as you're pointing out, it, it didn't only have a negative effect on the education or the knowledge or test scores, but it had a negative effect on the social life. Because it's important for children to socialize with others of the same age, whether it's uh, just hanging out or playing basketball or being in a theater group or an arts class or whatever, or just being together in school, that's very important for the social development. So I think that's devastating to do that. These lockdowns is only one part of a much more larger structural problems in society where there are a strong movement towards authoritarianism. This is not just the lockdowns, but you see it in the media, for example, with censoring. That affects the whole society. So I think we're sort of on a big fight now, whether the authoritarians are going to win or or not. And of course, the argument was that, okay, life is more important than freedoms. But I would say there was never a contradiction between those two. And freedom is essential for healthy life. And we saw that was proved during the pandemic. In the U.S., we have the First Amendment that guarantees freedom of speech. And that was actually written after a very turbulent time in U.S. history, where the Americans were fighting, I guess, you guys, or the king of, of England, to be independent. So they knew that freedom of speech and the First Amendment was especially important in a time of crisis. And I think that's what's proved here during the lockdown. Freedom of speech is always important. But if everything is great, well, we may not suffer too much from it. But in a crisis like this, that's when we really, really have to have freedom of speech. To me, that's a huge concern that social media companies were censoring people. They were censoring me when I said scientifically true things. But uh, they shouldn't even censor false information. Like if somebody said, I want to say that the Earth is flat, they should let people do that. Claiming to combat misinformation, they actually censored true public health information from myself and many other people. So that's pretty astonishing. I never thought I would live in the Western world and have to deal with censoring. I thought that was something that was sort of accepted by everybody, that we have freedom of speech. And so I'm a co-plaintiff in a, in a lawsuit in the U.S. called Missouri versus Biden, and sometimes Murphy versus Missouri that was heard by the Supreme Court a week ago because the federal government were coercing the social media companies to censor us. I'm not the main victim of that, but the people cannot hear things. So on lockdowns, that was very vocal because that's my area of expertise, the public health and infectious disease technology. I'm not an expert on virology, so I never voiced my view about whether it was a lab leak or uh, the wet market where was the original, because that's not my expertise. But I want to hear other people discussing that who doesn't know about this. And they were censoring there also. They were censoring people who were arguing for a uh, lab leak and slandering them. So I was the victim there, not because uh, I couldn't say what I wanted, because I had nothing to say, but I wanted to hear what everybody had to say on the matter. When you violate freedom of speech, it's not only the speaker that's harmed. It's primarily the society and everybody who can't have this discourse. 
Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, the double crime of censorship is not only that it stops someone from expressing themselves, but even worse, it stops the rest of us from hearing those things and making up our own minds. Uh, And I really agree that, you know, freedom of speech becomes more important in a crisis rather than less important. And one of the things I noticed during lockdown was that people started to treat freedom of speech and other freedoms too as these luxuries that could be dispensed with temporarily because we were in a crisis. And I just thought that is completely the wrong approach. It's precisely when you're making a severe decision like locking down or not locking down that you need the freest, most open debate possible in order that we can weigh up everything. And I think uh, the people who made that argument during lockdown, like you guys and others, I think was was incredibly important. Um, I did want to ask you actually a bit more about the freedom of speech issue and the case that you're pursuing and the joint enterprise in a way between the government in the United States and the corporate world, the social media oligarchs, the kind of billionaire class in Silicon Valley who did conspire, they did work together to brand people like you as, you know, pushers of misinformation, uh, liars, you were putting false material into the world. I mean, pretty slanderous accusations that were made. What do you think that tells us about respect for the First Amendment? And I presume this is one of the reasons you're taking this case, because, of course, in the US, unlike Britain, sadly, they have a First Amendment that forbids the government from interfering with citizens' speech rights. And in this case, that clearly did happen, even though they did it in an underhand way by putting pressure on their friends in the business world to censor you online. Um, What do you think that tells us about the First Amendment and about the Biden administration more broadly, that they would entertain that approach and actually pursue it as well? What I'm scared of is that there are so many among the public who don't really care about the First Amendment. They should think this was okay. That scares me to death. Because ultimately, it's the public who will determine whether we maintain freedom of speech or not. Uh, We know uh, one example from Twitter, uh, where we can trace a little bit. Somebody asked me whether people should get the vaccine or not. So I said, well, yeah, people are at high risk, older people. The vaccine is very important for them. But if you're valid to have COVID, then you have infection-acquired immunity or natural immunity. You don't need it. And children don't need it. So very simple, and I stand by those assessments. I think that's proven true. But that was censored by Twitter. And we know that they were censored at the behest of the government because the federal government, they were paying a group of people at Stanford University called the Verity Project. Uh, So they were paying them to tell the social media companies what to censor or not. They were the one who, who was telling Twitter, you should censor this post. So we know sort of that the federal government was sometimes outsourcing this censorship enterprise by paying people to to do their bidding. Uh, But also sometimes they did it directly. Somebody at the White House would directly contact the social media company and coerce them to censor something. So uh, some of it was direct, some of it was indirect. But I think in both cases, it's equally bad. Uh, I would also say, though, that I think the social media companies, they should not do their censoring even if there was no coercion. There are platforms. So if you are a if you're a newspaper or a, or a TV station, you can decide what to publish. But you're also responsible for what's, what's being said. So that's sort of one thing. On the other hand, if you're the telephone company or a post office, you're not responsible for what I say. But also, they can't censor me. If I made a letter, they can say, no, I'm going to deliver that because I don't agree with you. They will deliver it and they have to. The social media companies are more like the telephone company and the mail company in the sense that they should let everybody say what they want as long as it's legal. If it's illegal, they should take it away. But if it's legal content, they should let people do it and because they're not responsible for it. There's the law in the U.S. It's called Section 420 that says that if I say something, they're not liable for what I say. They have that protection, but then they should not be allowed to censor. They should have to go either way. Now they have the cake and they get to eat it too. And of course, they know this, is, they know this benefit. So therefore, when the government pressures them, they are afraid of losing this Section 420. So therefore, they will accommodate the government. Yeah, I think um, the lockdown experience really brought to the fore a discussion that society needs to have, but it seems reluctant to have, which is the power that these private companies have over public discussion. 
and uh, sometimes they enjoy that power because they have come to colonize so many areas of public discussion and you know social media is very often the modern public square and and they are in control of it but sometimes they have that power over public discussion because the government has given it to them and as you say the government whispers in their ears and says take this down take that down we had a similar experience with matt hancock who was the health secretary here you mentioned him already um, who was putting pressure on Facebook to take down certain forms of material. So there's a really important discussion to have, I think, about how we've allowed corporations to exercise so much control over what is essentially or what ought to be free public discussion. And people seem unwilling to have that debate, I think. So there are problems in the US, but there are also problems in the European Union. For example, the Digital Services Act, which uh, is sort of a we want to be able to censor things when we want to act. And there are other similar things in the European Union. So the European Union is not upholding freedom of speech. On the contrary, they have in some ways taken the lead against freedom of speech. So, and that's very concerning uh, because also what EU does doesn't only affect the EU. It also affects other countries around the world because the social media companies then have to sort of accommodate the EU. And then there's less freedom of speech also in the UK or in Turkey or India or Brazil or and so on. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned there uh, one of the tweets that landed you in hot water where you responded to someone by saying, I don't think everyone needs to get the COVID vaccine. You said that you don't think children need it. You don't think some young people need it. Of course, you were instantly branded as a crazy anti-vaxxer, even though you have uh, written and spoken in defense of vaccination programs and the essential role they play in public health. But that kind of slander was put your way, as we came to expect in the lockdown period. You also got some flack for a tweet you did about mask mandates. I thought it was quite a funny tweet where you compared it to, you know, we're forced to wear masks over here. Women are forced to wear burqas in Afghanistan. You know, that kind of uh, government mandated covering of the face uh, and and why that can be problematic. But I, I wanted to ask you specifically on vaccine mandates and mask mandates and that kind of mandated uh, approach to our own health and even what we have to wear in public. You know, I remember when mask mandates came in here in the UK, I found them so alienating, so horrible. You know, you couldn't even smile at the old lady as you walked past her on the street. Uh, it was impossible to understand what anyone was saying to you. Most people were kind of just pulling their masks down while they were talking anyway. Um, and they weren't particularly effective. So could you just say something on those mandates and why you think so many people went along with it, the mask mandate in particular, even though it didn't seem to do much good for society? So we know from clinical trials, one study in Denmark and one study in Bangladesh, that the masks have zero or minimal efficacy against spreading the disease. And that's what you would expect because there are similar studies for influenza from before the pandemic. But this matters actually was very detrimental for public health. One, of course, is that you don't try to mandate things in public health anyhow, because public health is based on trust. In Sweden, there was never mask mandates, except for airplanes, I think. And by one tweet I was uh, censored for by Twitter was when I said that, well, when you say that mask works, this is not true. You give at best minimal protection. What you're basically telling people, you're telling all the people, oh, okay, you can go out to this crowded restaurant as long as you wear a mask, because the mask will keep you safe. Well, it won't. You're lying to these people, and then they get a false sense of security, and then they will go out to this restaurant, and maybe they get infected and they die. So to falsely claim that these masks work when they don't actually kill people, it should never have been done. Uh, and of course, it's even worse to, than to mandate them. On vaccines, I have been labeled as an anti-vaxxer, and at the same time, I was fired by CDC because I was too pro-vaccine, the main public health agency in the U.S. Uh, so at one point in the spring of 2021, there was some blood cloth in uh, women under 50 who took the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So CDC decided to do a pause on the vaccine and not distribute it, which I think was very reasonable for young women because that's where we saw a potential problem. and also they don't really need it very much because they're such low risk. On the other hand, I objected to passing it for older Americans uh, in the 70s or 80s or 90s because we had a shortage of vaccines. This was the only one-dose vaccine, so uh, 
uh, it was important to reach older people in the rural area, for example, or homeless people, where it's hard to get them to get two doses. So I objected to that. Uh, and when I mentioned it to people at CDC, my colleagues, no, nothing happened. They went uh, on with the past. So then I published an op-ed in The Hill, uh, which is a news organization in, in D.C., and CDC didn't like that. So they fired me from the COVID vaccine safety committee because I was basically objecting to their, their policy. And then four days later, they actually uh, removed the pause. So they did do what I suggested, but the damage for that vaccine was already done. So a lot of people were taking that vaccine, but after the pause, it never recovered. So people were taking them the mRNA vaccines instead. If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. I think you might be the first person in history to be socially reprimanded, both for being supposedly anti-vax and overly pro-vax. So that's a good accolade for you, I think. Um I want to ask you just a couple more questions, Martin. You've already touched upon some of the consequences that you experienced as a result of dissenting on the lockdown issue. I want to ask you about uh, your relationship with Harvard University, because you've recently departed Harvard and you wrote a piece saying that um, one of the reasons you've been pushed out is because of your position on lockdowns, because you uh, defended the Swedish approach, you um, suggested that uh, America might have, uh, other countries might have benefited from adopting the Swedish approach as well. Could you just say a little bit about what your experience with Harvard has been? Obviously, you were there for a long time. You were a professor of medicine. You were a statistician there. Uh, what's your experience with them now? What, what has happened there? They were not happy with uh, the Great Britain Declaration. Uh, and there were two colleagues who tried to organize a debate with those at Harvard who were in favor of lockdowns. But uh, I said yes, of course, but they did not want to have that debate with me. But then the other disagreement was about uh, infection-acquired immunity or national immunity. So we have known since, since uh, 430 BC during the Athenian play that if you recover from an infection, you actually have immunity. And you might get sick again, but you have protection against uh, severe disease. Depending on what the disease are, like measles, once you've had it, you'll have it. You're not going to have it again. For coronaviruses, you can get it again, but it's less serious. So we knew that if you have had COVID, you have superior immunity than compared to the vaccine. And we knew that before the vaccine came out that we had good natural immunity. And we knew it uh, within half a year of getting the vaccine that the immunity was better from the having had COVID than having had the vaccine, which is exactly what you would expect. It would be a, a very big surprise in terms of the science if it was the other way around. Because the vaccine is basically trying to mimic what the immune system does. So I thought it was both unscientific to mandate vaccines. I think there shouldn't be vaccine mandates for, for other reasons, but to mandate it for people who already had it, who have superior immunity, that's unscientific and scientific nonsense. Nurses at the Harvard hospitals I never saw any COVID patients because I'm not a physician, but we had nurses who were day in and day out taking care of COVID patients at the Harvard hospitals. They got sick in COVID. They stay home for a while. They go back to work taking care of more COVID patients. And then when the vaccine came out, some hospital bureaucrat is saying, no, they can't work here no more because uh, you're not vaccinated, even though they have much better immunity than the vaccinated. The Harvard hospital should have hired nurses and others, healthcare workers who had had COVID because they have the best immunity. So it's completely unscientific. When Harvard mandates vaccines, 
whether it's the university uh, for students or the hospitals, that's very unscientific. It's also unethical. Now, the COVID vaccines are not the, the greatest vaccine we've ever had. The major problem with with myocarditis and so on, but and they are not, uh, they don't prevent infections and so on. But let's let's for the sake of argument, let's suppose that these were the perfect vaccines with hundred percent efficacy and no adverse reactions. Even if that's the case, it's very unethical to mandate the vaccines because we have a shortage of vaccines. So why should I or somebody else who already have COVID take a vaccine? that won't benefit us when my 87-year-old neighbor hadn't gotten the vaccine yet. Or when people in India or Nigeria or Brazil, older poor people who could benefit from this vaccine when they haven't gotten it yet. So that was highly unethical then to, to take a vaccine that you didn't need or to force people to take a vaccine that you didn't need. So if you're pro-vaccine, and which I am, and if you think that this vaccine was the best ever, which I don't think it was. But if, if you, even if you think that, even if that was the case, then you would uh, be against the vaccine mandate. So vaccine mandate is actually a very anti-vaccine position. For this reason I say, but there's actually a third reason for it being anti-vaccine, because you actually diminish trust in vaccines, but you force people to take it. And we have seen that it didn't only affect the COVID vaccine, it also affected um, uh, childhood vaccines that are sort of the race that's gone down. Like measles vaccine is a very important vaccine. Some childhood vaccines are more important than others. So uh, the biggest anti-vaxxers are the people who pretend they are for vaccines, but who were pushing for these vaccine mandates. They're the biggest anti-vaxxers, and they have done enormous damage to vaccine confidence. People know about natural immunity. And then you say, well, why would somebody have to take it if they've already had it? That doesn't make sense. So then there must be something fishy here. And I think there was something fishy. But then you're not going to trust them when they talk about other vaccines. So, oh, okay, if, if they don't get it right on the COVID vaccine, maybe they are lying about these other vaccines as well. And, and CDC and, and the, the health authorities in the UK, I mean, they said a lot of things that was not true during the pandemic. But not everything they say is untrue. When they tell you not to smoke, for example, that's true. You shouldn't smoke. That's dangerous for your health. So it's not, not everything they say is false. But if you say some false things, then people will question the things that they say that are not false. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that worries me about the post-lockdown moment is that a lot of the skepticism towards lockdown, there's the healthy skepticism expressed by uh, people like you, but there is an emergence of a less healthy form of skepticism, shall we say, where some people have taken the message that everything they say to us is a lie. Uh, they're all out to get us. There's this rotten regime injecting us with drugs that will shorten our lives or kill us. You know, there's this kind of hysterical response to the lockdown moment too, which is, I don't think, particularly useful for the kind of discussion we ought to have, even if it's understandable for the reasons you've outlined there in relation to the vaccines, which is that there is this potential blowback if the government and the authorities aren't honest with us about what's going on and what they're doing and so on. But it's also actually a gift to those uh, in the government who was pushing this false narrative because they can now use that, oh, okay, this crazy person thinks that uh, 5G towers are, are bad and uh, you can't sort of, they can use that as an excuse to dismiss others. It's actually good for some of these authoritarian agencies like WHO or CDC when people are, are sort of pushing that. But it's very understandable. And this original sentiment of not trusting public health agencies, I think, is right on the money. Uh, I don't trust them anymore. Uh, yes, but they say something. So either I want to read it myself or there are certain scientists that... Uh, like Sunita Gupta, Carl Hennigan, or Tom Jefferson, or Carol Sikora in the UK, and uh, also in the US and in, in Scandinavia and other places that I trust. But I don't trust what, uh, what the public health agencies are saying anymore. Uh, following on from that, my final question for you is in relation to the next virus. We hear about the next virus all the time. The next big one is going to come soon or it will come at some point in the future. Um, are we ready for it? Are we prepared? Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about how we will respond the next time there is something like COVID-19. And I wanted to get your views on 
what you think our response will be. Do you think there is now sufficient uh, concern about the consequences of lockdown to mean that we won't do it again? Or do you think because of the pre-existing authoritarian nature in some of our societies, we might do it again? What What's your prediction? If there were to be another COVID-19 type virus in the next few years, how do you think we would react to it? Well, first of all, there will be another pandemic. We'll have pandemics throughout history. I I would be surprised if it's the next few years. Uh, it could be, but it could be 10 years, so, but it could also be 50 years from now. We don't know. That's impossible to know. Also, we don't know if it could be like COVID, but it could be also very different. Like the 1918 flu was different in the sense that uh, the older people were actually less at risk. Younger people were more at risk. So we don't know what the next pandemic will be, but there will obviously be one. I don't think we can do lockdowns because the resistance is not so strong. The authoritarians will try again, I think, but I don't think they will succeed. But it's also important that we get to write the history correctly about this pandemic. Because if it happens 40 or 50 years, uh, I won't be around anymore. And uh, you may be still, but uh, there will be new people. And it's important that we have getting the history right so that people can learn the lessons, even if the people in charge then are people that uh, are, are not yet alive. But I'm optimistic that they cannot push a, a lockdown on, a, on the next pandemic. But as I said, it is a bigger issue of authoritarianism. So they will try to use it, uh, maybe scare people with other things. Martin, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. listening to the Brendan O'Neill show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe and in the meantime keep reading spiked at www.spiked-online.com.